Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, most respected chief guest, honorable vice chancellor, dignitaries, guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. I, Pratik Manjul, convener of the Literary and Debating Committee of the Student Bar Association, welcome you all to the second Swami Vivekanand Memorial Lecture on the auspicious occasion of National Youth Day that is celebrated to commemorate the birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda. And to mark this occasion, as our chief guest and keynote speaker, we have the privilege to have with us Swami Atmapriyanandji, Honorable Pro-Chancellor and Secretary, Ramakrishna Mission, Vivekanand Educational Research Institute, to enlighten us on the topic, Ethical Values in Contemporary Times, Revisiting the Teachings of Swami Vivekananda. In all the chaos and struggle that the contemporary age offers to us, the teachings of Swami Vivekananda, who deserves no introduction because he is well known throughout the world due to his teachings and the values that he has spread, are of an ever-growing value and significance for all of us. His ideas on the possibilities that determined human spirit can achieve are something that happens to be an inspiration for all the young minds. Let me share an experience that I myself uh, have encountered. As a child, I used to go to the mutt of the Ramakrishna mission nearby to my house. And it was my parents who gifted me the book that was Swami Vivekanand, his call to the nation. The teachings uh, of Swami Vivekanand in his book introduced me first to the ideas that he is well known for. His idea that the awakening of this nation shall happen not with its physical or material strength, but rather with this nation's spiritual strength offers to us not only an alternative to the exploitative nature of material intensive progress, but also a way forward to achieve peace and contentment while embodying empathy and selfless service of humanity. Swami Vivekananda, as we all know, as a speaker and a monk, has guided millions throughout the world and through ages. His ideas have guided people towards serving humanity selflessly and to, and to embody the values and ideas that have grown over centuries and millennia in this country. Now I welcome uh, Garima Agrawal, my co-anchor and the vice convener of the Literary and Debating Committee to move forward with the proceedings. Good evening to one and all present here. HNLU is blessed to have at its helm a renowned academician and administrator par excellence, Professor Dr. V.C. Vivekanandan, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Vivekanandan has over three decades of teaching and research experience in legal education, particularly IP and internet law, and has also served at National Law School Bangalore and Nalsar University of Law Hyderabad between 1990 and 2017. He, was, he also was the Dean at Rajiv Gandhi School of IP Law at IIT Kharagpur between 2009 and 2010 and was the founding dean of the School of Law at Bennett University at Greater Noida during 2017 to 2019. At HNLU, Sir has been spearheading numerous initiatives aimed towards ensuring that HNLU makes a mark at the international legal community. Sir, I now invite you to share your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. So uh, let me begin. It's our pleasure to have today with us Swami Atma Priyananda as the chief guest and the speaker to deliver the second memorial lecture of Swami Vivekananda. The first memorial lecture was done last year by the Chief Minister, Honorable Chief Minister of Chhattisgarh. Mr. Bhupesh Bahel last year, and it also marked of us opening the statue of Swami Vivekananda in one of our entrance. 
and today marking his 160th birthday we are uh, having the second memorial lecture to be delivered by swami atmapriyananda on the teachings of swami vekananda and its uh, contemporary relevance and as you said that uh, the convener of uh, the committee of hnlu was briefly sharing how he was attracted and how he was going towards uh, the ashram and his own personal connection at his age so interestingly i also have to share that uh, when uh, when i was a child when my name was actually fixed as some other name by the family members normally based on astrology they say in which syllable it should start they had some other name it looks i understand when they are about to give the name in the cradle ceremony what they call my grandfather who was present there changed my name to vivekananda much to a little taken aback that why but he was a great uh, devotee of uh, ramakrishna swami and then he said that i am going to name him and they were little worried that is not as per uh, you know so called astrological you know predictions or whatever but my grandfather simply ignored and said this is the name he should have so it was a very interesting connect if i really look one way why i am named that way and people used to tell it's my grandfather who did that and also i do recollect my grandfather telling me on one of my first trips to united states way back in the year 1986 he said uh, you have to visit chicago and then uh, send me a postcard from there so it's a very interesting facet that i am also now part part of this institute where we are celebrating his uh, birthday with the second memorial lecture and swami vivekananda's connection with raipur is well recorded by himself he spent 3 years 77 to 79 in raipur of a break which he was taking from calcutta with his parents coming down here for various reasons and this 3 years very interestingly he was not into any formal education because there were no schools worth at that point of time so he had a break in his studies from calcutta but he goes back and starts his studies but this 3 years seems to be the most contemplative years and the travel he himself records coming from jabalpur to raipur in a bullock cart those days and then this travel moving with the nature everything gives him a greater insight and slowly we are really seeing about uh, the evolution of swami vekananda at later stage trying to do as far as uh, if i take few minutes because i'm pretty sure the speaker today who's part of ramkrishna mission has much more insights to tell us but if i do look at little bit to talk about why we think of swami vekananda not ceremonially his birthday today it is also to tell that he was a kind of a, a very modern spiritual thinker and teacher he sought to integrate religious principles into the daily lives of people emphasizing importance of ethics in our behavior and attitudes he tried to introduce a new ethical system of thought so what many people have interpreted vedanta but he had his own interpretation or a new way of looking at it whose core values is about cultivating the virtues you have for they will be the roots bearing sweet fruits in due season this is one of his thought process the ethical teachings encompass a broad range of topics morality to relationships to work to health and for him he spoke of karma not in a mysterious sense but obviously pinning down one's own action that makes up one's life or to emphasize the importance of ethical values he advocated people to be honest truthful and humble and to be generous and compassionate where he does say let your life be a lesson to others so if you really look his importance of peace and understanding a very key feature of his teachings which is um, very much a very important part in a world where we find too many disturbances in, in different parts 
He taught that peace is the greatest form of ethical value and it can be only achieved through humility and selflessness. He preached that people should live in harmony with each other and be tolerant of differences. He advocated for respecting the right of others, avoiding negative speech or actions, not causing any harm or suffering through one's actions. This all becomes a very clear, you know, uh, not only preaching the way he lived, even though he lived very short in terms of his lifespan. So his teachings are characterized by a focus of inner values and thereby achieving inner peace. So it, it, it emphasis is to cultivate spiritual values such as compassion, love, and wisdom. He taught that one could achieve inner peace and contentment only through these devotion of spiritual practices. So if you really look at it, is in my closing remark, honesty, humility, and peace. This could be the one condensation of uh, Swami Vekanda's teaching, which I'm pretty sure is definitely the need of contemporary times. I would like to, at this point, um, close my opening remarks and um, uh, would like to give the floor to the anchor. And once again, thanking uh, Swamiji for accepting our invitation and to be part today to, you know, what you call as give his thoughts on Swami Vivekananda's teachings. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your speech. Now, our chief guest, Swami Adhan Priyanandaji, is a monk of the Ramakrishna order and an Indian university administrator. He was the first vice chancellor of Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University. He received his PhD in theoretical physics involving elementary particle theory from the University of Madras. He has a number of research publications in this area in reputed international journals. He joined the Ramakrishna Order of Monks in 1978, inspired by Ramakrishna Vivekanand's ideology of spiritual liberation combined with service to humanity in the spirit of worship of God in man and has been serving higher education institutions for nearly four decades. Swami Atmapriyanandji served as the vice chancellor of Ramakrishna Mission University for a little more than 15 years since its very inception for this unique institution, which has been uh, envisaged uh, by Swami Vivekanand himself. He continues to be associated with the Ramakrishna Mission, as well as is currently the pro-chancellor and secretary of the Vivekanand Educational and Research Institute. As an educator, administrator, spiritual guide, and most importantly, a teacher, Swami Atmapriyanandji has contributed immensely to the society, especially towards students, and is the best person to guide us on today's theme. I welcome today's keynote speaker as well as our chief guest, Swami Atmapriyanandji, to enlighten our audience today. So may we begin with a peace chant called Shanti Mantra in the Vedas. Shanti Mantras are prefixed and suffixed to every Upanishad, which is called Vedanta, in order to invoke peace and humanity. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahe Tejasvina Vadhe Tamastu Mavid Vishavahe Om Shanti 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 May the Supreme Being protect us, both the teacher and the disciple, by revealing to us the true nature of knowledge. May the Supreme Being protect us, both the teacher and the disciple, by revealing to us the application of the knowledge for the benefit of humanity. May we both, the teacher and the disciple, cultivate knowledge and the knowledge and wisdom that we cultivate be effective and illuminative. May there be no disharmony or dissension between us. Om peace, peace, peace. Om tam deshikendram paramam pavitram Vishwasya palam madhuram yatindram Hitayarunam naramurti mantam Viveka anandamaham namami 
I bow down to Swami Vivekananda, the great teacher who is the embodiment of existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. Namashri Yati Rajaya Vivekananda Suraye Satchit Sukhaswarupaya Swamine Tapaharine. I'm very delighted to be here to share some views with the faculty and the students of Hidayatullah National Law University, Raipur, as just now the Honorable Vice Chancellor, who also bears the name of Swami Vivekananda, Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, was telling you, Raipur is very special in Vivekananda's life. As a kid, Swamiji grew up in Raipur for a couple of years. And as was mentioned, Swami Vivekananda, at that time Narendra Nath, was traveling in a cart through a forest. And he's so fascinated by nature. And he saw a huge honeycomb, massive and large. And he was struck by the beauty of nature, how the bees collecting honey bit by bit had built up such a large comb and wondering about the mystery of nature and the creator who has given so much wisdom to these little bees to collect honey, he was overwhelmed, lost consciousness, fell into a trance. That was the first samadhi which he experienced there at Raipur, and therefore Raipur is particularly special for us. Today on the 12th of January, Raipur Chief Minister, the Chhattisgarh Honorable Chief Minister has called uh, uh, our Vice Chancellor, Swami Sarvottamananda, who also hails from Raipur, and he had his education in IIT Kanpur in computer science. They are uh, inaugurating a, a museum or an exhibition in the very house where Swami Vivekananda stayed, has been acquired by the government. So today is a very, very special day for all of us. The awakener of modern India, this is what Swami Vivekananda is called. What was it this trying to awaken? He was very simply put, he was trying to awaken the spiritual consciousness which is in everybody. Once he said, my ideal indeed can be put into a few words, and that is the teaching to mankind is divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. Spirituality is not something which is divorced from daily life, as your Honorable Vice Chancellor just now mentioned. Spirituality interpenetrates and is inextricably intertwined with every activity of all human beings. Swami Vivekananda very humorously said, a Hindu eats religiously because he chants mantras before and after. He bathes religiously because at every bath you are supposed to chant mantras. And very humorously, even steals religiously. <laughs> you can see Descartes. Before they go, they go to the Kali temple, and Jai Kali, and then they will go for, <laughs> for, for, for thieving. So he says every moment of a Hindu's life is based upon religion. Religion and religion alone is the backbone of India. But religion, he did not mean the ritualistic category of religion. How many rituals you performed, what are the ceremonies you did, and so on. And Dr. Sarvabal Radhakrishnan once beautifully mentioned, religion is not doctrinal conformity in our ceremonial piety. It is participation in the wisdom of being. It is insight into reality. He also said once, religion is self-discovery, or rather recovery. It is soul's dialogue with itself. So religion is spirituality, according to Swami Vivekananda. By spirituality, no mystery mongering is meant. It is not the spooky mystery mongering kind of religion in which you look for ghosts and uh, other supernatural beings who come and then tell you messages. 
you are that infinite self in you is infinite power. This was the message of Swami Vivekananda. And the kind of ethics which he preached was Atman-centric ethics. Ethics does not consist in a series of do's and don'ts. In the present day, the contemporary times is mentioned in the topic. In the contemporary times, as you know, our boys and girls, the young people particularly, are intensely averse to being told what to do and told what not to do. It's not a series of dictates that you have. It is not Anushasana, but it is Jigyasa. The great book, the Brahma Sutras, which is the canon of Vedanta, begins by the first sutra, Athato Brahma Jigyasa. Now, therefore, we begin the investigation into Brahman. Religion is investigatory, religion is exploratory, religion is open-ended like science. A scientist explores, a scientist investigates, a scientist does not expect what could be the result, is very open to whatever truth leads him. The investigation leads him. In the Upanishads, it's called Vedanta, and Swami Vivekananda said, I preach nothing but the Upanishads, and in it the great message of strength. Strength, strength is the only message the Upanishads give you, because the strength which comes from within is far superior to the strength which is acquired from without. Three kinds of Bala are strength are mentioned in the Shastras, in the scriptures, in the Hindu wisdom of the Vedas and the Rishis. One is Bahubala, the muscle strength. I have so much of strength. Muscle strength includes the strength of the weaponry, strength of money, strength of your um, the army which you have, all the physical strength that you have, the infrastructure which you possess, the physical strength. But that can be destroyed, which you are seeing now. Just a bomb and the whole thing is gone. Physical strength is ephemeral, it is destructible. And then you have the intellectual strength, this is also superior. You write a book, a powerful thought can transform the world. Karl Marx did not go for war, did not revolutionize. In his name, so much of revolution took place. All that he did was to write a powerful book and send thought currents across the world, which picked up upon certain minds and they worked it out. So thought is extremely powerful. India realized the power of thought long ago. Swami Vivekananda therefore said, if a holy man sits in a cave and thinks five holy thoughts and dies there, these thoughts will penetrate through the caves, walls of the caves, and fasten on to some heart and mind and work out there. Such is the power of thought. Thought is extremely powerful, and thought is articulated in speech. And therefore, the Indian sages said, be extremely careful about what you speak, and that speech should be based upon what you think. Be careful about what you think. And ethics is simply the unison between the mind and the speech. Speak what you think and do what you speak. It is so simple, but the most difficult to practice. Vang me manasi pratishthita mano me vachi pratishthitam The Vedas say the mind should be based upon speech and the speech should be established on thoughts. They should be unison. Sri Ramakrishna, the great divine guru, of Swami Vivekananda said, Mon Muk Akkoro. Make the mind and the speech one. So, what the problem, the ethical problem of the modern times, if 
a man at the top position in several spheres, when he says something, even a child knows it's absolutely untrue. <laughs> so the trust deficit which we talk about is terrible because there is no belief, there's no faith in the voices of men, what they speak. Vak is considered extremely sacred. And Vak is supposed to be originating from fire. Fiery speech, we say, Vak is so sacred and you should not, it should not be a sacrilege of Vak. Swami Ranganathanandaji, our venerable president who passed away some time ago, he always used to say, about an incident which he which happened in his life when he was at the age of five. He was a school kid. He went to school and picked up several slang words from these from his co-students. He came home and then expressed some of them, and his mother was crying. His mother took the child in the lap and said, You see, the tongue is the Pitastana of Saraswati, Vagdevi. Don't defile the tongue by such words which are not proper to speak. Till the end of his life, after 90 years, he remembered this and said, be careful about what you speak. We see now one speech, one word, either consciously or unconsciously, it costs you very heavily. It can cause wars, it can cause conflicts. So the speech which is important is based upon thought. If we constantly think about thoughts of hatred, acrimony, jealousy, quarrel, constantly it will come out to you. So be careful about what you think. <clears throat> so the intellectual strength is also feeble, fragile, or intellect goes away after some time. It's only the brain which functions. With age, you senility sets in, dementia sets in, and you can't remember anything anymore. So the real strength is the Atma Bala. The Bala are the strength which comes from the Atman, which is undecaying, immortal, eternal self of man. Beyond the body and beyond the senses, beyond the mind, beyond thought, beyond speech, there is undecaying eternal self. Ajo nitya shashvato yam purano nahanyate hanyamane sharire. The Bhagavad Gita says, Ajaha nitya shashvata. Ajai unborn, nitya eternal, shashvata permanent. And this is the undecaying Atman, and it is the source of eternal bliss. It is described in Vedanta Sat Chit Ananda. Sat, existence. Chit, consciousness and knowledge. Ananda, which is bliss. Are they mere talk? No. Swami Ramakrishna Ananda, who is a very dear brother, disciple of Swami Vivekananda, was sent by Swami Vivekananda to the southern part of India to start the work there. He was a great scholar, he was a mathematician and a Sanskritist in one. He gives a very simple example to prove this. Every moment of our life, we are expressing our nature as Satchidananda. How? Example. Everybody in the universe wants to live and live. Wants to exist. Nobody can imagine his own non-existence. He is trying to close your eyes and say, I am not there. <laughs> Try and see. Suppose I close my eyes and feel I am not there. Who is it that is saying I am not there? I say I am not there. And therefore you, I, should always exist. This is one proof of the existence of God according to Vedanta. Vedantic God is not out there sitting somewhere. Vedantic God is not the temples and the churches and mosques. Vedantic God is in your own self, in your own heart. Ishwara Sarvabhutani Hridesh Arjuna Tashtati. The Bhagavad Gita says, O Arjuna, Ishwara is sitting in your own heart. The tenth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita talks about Vibhuti Yoga, the glories of God. 
what we now call the signature of God. God has signed in the Himalayas, he says, I am here. In the big ocean, I am here. We need something very vast and wonderful. God's vibhuti, God's glory is expressed there. What is the first glory? Bhagavan begins by saying, Ahamatma gudakesha sarva bhutashaya sthitaha. O Arjuna gudakesha, conqueror of sleep, I am the Atman in all the beings, in the hearts of all beings. So that the greatest vibhuti of God, God is gloriously expressing himself as the Atman in all beings. So Swami Vivekananda picked up and said, why not worship man? Why not worship all beings as manifestations of God? But God himself proclaims in the Bhagavad Gita that he is present in all beings as the Atman. So Vedanta says, you can deny everything in the world. Even scientists can deny. Suppose you say, a new kind of planet has been discovered somewhere. I don't accept it. I deny it. Suppose you say, God is sitting there somewhere and guiding you. I don't accept. I deny it. You can deny everything. But can you deny yourself? I deny that I exist. Can you say that? Suppose you said that. And you are asked, who says I am denying? I say that I don't exist. <laughs> if you say, I say I don't exist, who says that? I say you exist. You should exist to be able to say that I don't exist. And therefore, the undeniable, incontrovertible, irreducible substratum, which is the I, whose real swarupa nature, if you inquire into you, is God. Vedanta, God is your own higher self which always should exist. You cannot imagine your own destruction. One. Secondly, everybody wants to know. Nobody wants to remain a, a, without any knowledge. He wants to know more and more and more. Human mind is craving for more and more knowledge. It explores the kind of exploration that the human mind takes up, outside and inside. Is remarkable. And the Western, in the Europe and the West, they took up exploration of the outer nature. Vivekananda mentions this. Two voices have spoken, one of Asia, the other of Europe. Europe takes the external nature, which is vast and grand. The sun and the moon and the nebulae and the oceans and the mountains. Remarkable. So dive deep into the oceans to find out what they consist of and go into space and explore more and more. And the Indian mind, the Asian mind went inward, the inner nature and explore. The outer nature is grand and wonderful, but grander and more wonderful is the inner nature of man and that exploration which what our ancient rishis took up. Why did they do it? They tried to explore the outer nature and they found that there's no end to it. And they also discovered that if you discover the microcosm within, you can discover the macrocosm also because the microcosm and macrocosm are built on the same plan. That is science. The modern science says now the microcosm and the macrocosm are one and the same thing. The law governing the macrocosm can be easily discovered and explored into by looking at the microcosm. So you want to know more and more because your real nature is knowledge. You always want to exist because your knowledge is existence. Your nature is existence. You want to know more and more and more because your, your real nature is knowledge. And everybody wants to be happy. Nobody will say, please give me more misery, except Kunti Devi in the Mahabharata in a different context. Nobody will say, what do you want? I want to be happy. Well, I want to be miserable. I want to be extremely uh, unhappy. Anybody says that? Except when he is mad or drunk. Everybody wants to be happy. That shows your real nature is happiness. Your real nature is existence because you always want to exist. 
Your real nature is knowledge because you want knowledge more and more all the time. Your real nature is happiness because you want to be happy all the time. Existence, knowledge, happiness. Sat, Chit, Ananda is your real nature. This need not just by experience. This experiential simple proof, experimental proof as they say in science, by which you can show that your real nature is existence, knowledge, bliss, Satchit Ananda. And the God of Vedanta is Satchit Ananda. You don't have to go anywhere else. And Atma Bala is the strength which comes from the Atman, which is enduring, everlasting, indestructible. That was the Bala which gave India so much of inner strength and resilience by which in spite of thousands of vicissitudes and misfortunes, decadence and invasions, India has been holding on hardly 75 years of independence of foreign rule, which lasted more than a millennium. India is again rising and growing from strength to strength. Why? Because of the power of the tapasya of the great sages of India, who discovers the immortal truths. We are the children of those sages, Swami Vivekananda said. We should be proud to say that we are the children of those sages who have given us immortal great truths. <clears throat> and he says, here we sit and quarrel and fight and poo-poo everything holy because of the indoctrination of the Western influence of the Macaulay's type of education which are trying to get away with. But little do we know the heart pangs of millions outside the walls of India, putting forth their hands for a sip of that nectar which our forefathers have accumulated in this land. A great mission has been given to us, which is to conserve and to preserve and to accumulate as it were in a dynamo all the spiritual forces of mankind which will pour forth into a deluge when the times are propitious. This is Swami Vivekananda's statement. So all ethics, all morality emanates from the Atman within, which is eternally pure. And the phrase favorite was Sri Shankaracharya, Nitya Shuddha Buddha Mukta Swarupa, of the nature of Nitya Shuddha, eternally pure, Nitya Buddha, eternally awakened, Nitya Mukta, eternally free. So that is our real nature. So we don't have to acquire moral principles, ethical principles from outside. They are there within you, within the Atman. So how do you get them? Awaken the Atman. Puttishthata, Jagrata, Prapyavaran, Nibodhata. Swami Vivekananda is a very favorite quote from the Kathopanishad. Puttishthata, arise. Jagrata, awake. Prapyavaran Nibodhata. Approach the wise people, the learned people, those who are already illumined and Nibodhata learn from them. Swami Vivekananda's free translation, which is well known, arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached. Because all energy is within you. Why do you cry? Oh friend, why do you weep? All power is there within you. Kinnama Rodishaketvai Sarva Shaktihi. All power, all energy is within you. And spirit alone will conquer, consciousness alone will conquer, and not dull, dead matter. Atma Yuvahi Prabhavate, Atman alone will conquer, this is Atma Bala. I have an interesting story which is well known, the ancient old story, the quarrel between Vasishtha and Vishwamitra. Vishwamitra was a great king before he became a, a, a rishi. So much of power he wielded. He wanted to take away Kamadhenu, the wish-fulfilling cow, from Vasishtha's ashrama. He came with all his army and invaded the ashrama of Vasishta and said, I am going to snatch away the Kamadhenu. Vasishta quietly smiled and said, Don't try, my king. 
Kamadhenu will not leave this place. You can't take it away. What? You know my power? You try. Then he was good. He was reputed to be well versed in the Shastra and Astra. Shastra are the weapons, and Astra have certain specific mantras, incantations by which you can attack the enemy. This is the old uh, idea. So one by one he started using all the Shastra and Astra and the most powerful, the most dangerous and invincible Astra is called Brahmastra. Everybody knows Brahmastra because of the movie now. <laughs> So the Brahmastra, if you throw, nobody can, can stop it. And it is said it can be used only once, not more. So it is usually not used. Then Vishwamitra becomes so excited, so exasperated, so terribly angry and roused. Vasishta, here you see I'm going to throw the Brahmastra. Vasishta simply put a small stick there, symbolic of Atmabala. And Brahmadanda, it is called. One by one, he was throwing. When he threw the Brahmastra, even that Brahmastra was completely swallowed by this Brahmadanda. Swaha, Brahmastra vanished. Then Vishwamitra becomes frightened, completely confused. What is this? Even Brahmastra is futile before this small stick. There's Brahmavala. Then, folded hands, he said, Vashishtha, I accept defeat. What is the strength you tell me? What is the source of your strength? And the famous statement, on which depends the entire religious legacy, the spiritual heritage of India, Adhik balam, khatra balam, brahmate jo balam balam, fai and your shatra bala, all the bala of the intellect, the bahubala and the buddhi bala, Brahmate jo balam balam, the strength of the Atman, strength of Brahman, strength of purity, strength of uh, unselfishness, ethical and moral values, and beyond that, the realization of the Atman within, the spiritual strength is the greatest strength. And he said, see, look at the uh, sincerity of these great kings and rishis. Vishwamitra threw away his kingdom. If this is, I have seen before me, that Atmabala is the most supreme. So I throw away my kingdom, all my wealth, all my revenue, all my retinue, all my army. I am going to realize this Atman and Brahman. Intensest tapasya he did, and he was tempted by the Indra and so on, you know, because Devendra is terribly afraid of somebody does tapasya, <laughs> because he goes beyond the devatas. So somehow you want to control. The same politics which is happening now. So, Ultimately, he acquired the supreme knowledge of Brahman and came back. Now I am a Rishi. Then Vishishta said, you are a Rajarshi, because from Raja, you become a Rishi. He said, no, I should want the title of Brahmarshi. Again, he went, intensest tapasya for thousands of years. In our Puranas, we have zero liberal. 10,000 10, years, maybe 10 years. Again, he did, and came back glowing with the power of Brahman, knowledge of Brahman. Now you are a Brahmarshi. No, Vasishta should certify. So it's a proverb in Tamil. Vasishta while a Brahmarshi. That means the Brahmarshi title is given by Vasishta himself. So that is the story of India. So all the power which is within, this is Atman-centric ethics, which is, which is the spiritual ethics. It has no religion, there is no God, there are no books, there is no teacher. So you don't have to depend on anything outside for this kind of ethics, which is the most suitable for the modern age of the contemporary times. The great movement, particularly in the advanced countries like America and Europe, in which young people are revolting against religion, and they say, we want to be spiritual without being religious, going to temples and churches, and following certain ceremonies, they are revolting against all that, but they want some higher spiritual culture, purity, holiness, unselfishness, 
trying to help others, philanthropy, charity. These are the values which are attracting all the young people. Some great ideal in which self-sacrifice is involved, but they do not want to associate it with the so-called organized religion. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda therefore said, enter not into the door of the organized religious groups. We say that we are the supreme being. This, this church says this, that temple says this, that Gurudwara says this, this mosque says this. Young people say we have lost all faith in all these people. But where is the alternative? Here is Swami Vivekananda who gives you the alternative. I will give you the purest of the pure spiritual wisdom which is your own self. Can you deny yourself? So the most scientific religion, most scientific spirituality, which is exploratory, as I said, and not protocol-based. Protocol says you do this, you do this, first step, second step, third step. But Vedantic religion, Vedantic philosophy says there is no protocol, there's only investigation. Athato Brahma Jigyasa, the Taitari Upanishad. The father is the teacher, the son goes to the disciple to learn. In those days, all the so called householders who have children and, and property, they were all greatly learned sages. The idea of a sannyasin came much later because of Buddhism. What existed was the answer to Rishi. A rishi is not a sannyasi, Rishi is a householder. He had a wife and children. Yagya Valkya, the greatest Rishi of the Veda or the Upanishad, had two wives. So it doesn't matter what kind of life you live, but have you that purity? Have you that elevated mind? Have you the power of tapasya, the power of truth, power of unselfishness? Then you are a Rishi. Swami Vivekananda wanted to revive the ideal of the Rishihood in modern times. He said, become a Rishi. So the father was a teacher, he was a great jnani. And the son goes as a disciple. Bhruguru vai rishi varunam pitaram upasasara adhi hi bhagavo brahmeti. Aruni, the son of Aruna, Bhrugu, goes to his father. Sir, please teach me Brahman. Then he says, Simple different Yatova, Yamani, Bhutan, Ijayante, Yena Jatan, Ijivanti, Yat Prayanti, Abhisam Vishanti, Tad Vijig Yasaswa, Tad Brahm Heti. From that, all the worlds emerge, world of beings, sentient and non sentient emerge, in which they are sustained and into which they ultimately go and merge. That is Brahman, realizes Brahman. I said, how do I realize it? Tapasa Brahma Vijayasaswa Tapo Brahmeti. You can realize this Brahman through Tapasya. Tapasya is the intense investigation through self control, through meditation, through contemplation, the complete control over your body and senses. This is the method by which you go. I will not tell you what it is, you investigate. So, one by one, he investigates. First he investigates and finds out the entire thing is annamaya, matter. See how scientific the whole thing is. The whole thing, if you look at the world, the whole thing is only matter. The sun and the moon and the stars and the all the computers and the Android phones that you have, everything is non-conscious matter. Comes, I, I have discovered Brahman. Anna is Brahman. Annam Brahme Divya Janat Annadhyeva Bhutani jayanti, anne na jatani jivanti, annam prayante visam vishanti, tad vijig vijnaya punareva varunam pitara mupasasara. Again he comes back, and the teacher, interestingly, like a scientist, that was giving him the answer. Sir, I have discovered anna, pra, matter is everything. That's the physical science now says that. Then the teacher smiles and says, Good. Again, go and do tapasya. <laughs> and the disciple understand there is something more to it, not only matter. Tapasa brahma vijigyasa svatapo brahmeti satapo tapyada satapas tapva. Having meditated, having the intensest tapasya comes back. <clears throat> oh, beyond this 
there is life, prana, there is animation. Matter is not animated. Matter doesn't speak. Matter doesn't move. Matter doesn't react. Beyond there is a prana life, which is the biological sciences. Prana cheva kal vimani bhuta nijayanti, prane najata nijivanti, pranam prayanti avisam vishanti iti, tad vijnaya punareva varunam pitaram apasasara, adhi bhagavo brahmeti. Sir, I have discovered another layer of Brahman, which is prana, life. Immediately match with modern science. First we begin with physical sciences, then that is not sufficient. We go to life sciences. Then you ask what is the relation between matter and prana or life, which is Jagadish Chandra Bose's famous discovery. The demarcation between insentient matter and sentient sea, life doesn't really exist. It's a very, the borderline is blurred. That's the famous experiment which he showed. Comes back. And once again, the, look at the method of teaching. The teacher does not say this is the truth, this is Brahman, smiles, good. Go ahead, Tavasa, Brahma, Vijayagnasasva, investigate a little more, explore. Then comes and says, no, beyond that there's a mind. And the mental wave, the Bhavarajya, the Bhava Jagat, that is mental sciences. Physical sciences, matter, biological sciences, life. Then the mental science of is a psychology. So much of exploration into psychology in the West and West. We have done the intense exploration. The Buddhistic sages done the intensest exploration into the mind. Comes back, sir, everything is only mind. Waves of thought I see. He says, God, go ahead, little more. There is a vijnana. Beyond that is the buddhi, which is the determinative faculty in the human mind. Mind vacillates, mind oscillates between the do's and the don'ts, tweedledum and the tweedledee, to be or not to be, but doesn't come to a conclusion. The capacity of the mind which is deeper than the mind itself, which is called the buddhi, vijnana, which determines that's called the Dhi of the Gayatri Mantra. Dhyo Yona Prachodayat. Awaken the Dhi. Awaken that higher intuitive determinative faculty. Beyond this mind, which oscillates between the theses and antitheses, the dialectical process, there's the Buddhi, which is determinative, which is called the Dhi in the Gayatri Mantra, Medha in the Vedas, Prajna in the Yoga Sutra, first awaken that. Then he comes back, so again you go, finally, finally answers Ananda. Ananda Dheva Kalvimani Bhutani Jayante Anande Najatani Jeevanti Anandam Prayanta Visam Vishanti So this is the process of investigation. The values and the ethics are all embedded in your own self, first at the physical level, then at the biological level, prana level, then at the mental level, then deeper the intuitive, higher intelligence level, then ultimately at the level of ananda. Annamaya, pranamaya, manomaya, vijnanamaya, anandamaya, atma. These are the five cells which comprise the human personality. Human personality is not the physical self. Beyond that is the biological self. It's a marvelous system, the biological system. The cell biology is a great marvel how the cells cooperate with each other. And if one cell refuses to cooperate, that's called a cancerous cell. <laughs> Immediately it spreads. That's what is happening in society now. So some cancerous cells, if they come in, it's very difficult to tackle that. Beyond that is the intellectual self. Beyond that is the bliss self, which is called the Anandamaya. So Swami Vivekananda's this idea of exploring within and discovering all the values and ethics within you so that you don't have to get import any value from outside. 
from outside if any value is imposed, immediately the human mind revolts and does not know the rationale behind this value. Speak the truth, why? Don't harm anybody, why? Immediately people will ask. If you can harm somebody, steal somebody's wealth and get away with it, what is the harm? Vedanta says that's because you are harming yourself. You or the other man. You and the other are identical. The microcosm and the macrocosm being based upon the same plan. You as an entity cannot be separated from this universe. I am the universe and the universe is me. This discovery, which is called the Mahavakya, Aham Brahmasmi, this has been interpreted as a great philosophical and spiritual truth to be realized by the monks in the forests and by the yogis in the caves. Swami Vivekananda's great glory was to take this truth and put it in the marketplace, as he said. <laughs> the Vedanta of the hills and the caves has to be brought to the marketplace in everyday life. You can realize that even if you feel it a little, if not realize. Power will come, glory will come, all this good and grand will come when the soul awakens his self-conscious activity, he said. This is the only remedy for depression. Everybody is depressed, so unhappy. Because your mind is depressed, you are not depressed. Awaken that power of the Atman within. Swami says, think about this, dream about it. Tell yourself, I am that great self. How much I have achieved. Just think of the human body. I always tell my students, don't worry about God or Atman. Just think of the body. What a wonder and marvel is the human body. Unfortunately, beyond class 10, we don't have any idea of the human body. This has to be made a compulsory subject for everybody at all levels. Cell biology has heaps and bounds the researches have been done. How the cells are cooperating with one another. How the human body is such a wonderful mechanism. Just think. The heart is constantly pumping 24 by 7, 365 days in a year from the moment you have been born in the mother's womb till the day in which you will be burnt at the funeral ghat. The heart is pumping all the time. It doesn't feel tired. If the heart says, oh, I want a little rest, I apply for a casual leave for one day, you're finished. And it is cooperating with the lungs. Suppose somebody gives me, give me a glass of water. Oh, the old water, give me fresh water. We normally say that. But do you know, the amount of blood in the human body is constantly circulated, recirculated again and again and again every day, day after day, year after year, till you die. Suppose you say, I want some fresh blood, then you will die. What is the secret? The human body has a capacity for self-renewal. This is a concept from science. Nature is a capacity for self-renewal. It renews itself. It is called in Vedanta, Punarapi Nava. It is old, but eternally new. Purana is explained by Shankaracharya in the Gita Bhashya as Purapi Nava. Nature, if you see, constantly it is renewing itself. When you look at a beautiful moon, the full moon night, or the sun rising in the east in the morning, does anybody feel, oh, it's the same sun which I saw yesterday, I am tired. Don't say that. It's a miracle. It's a wonder. Oh, sun has risen. Because every moment, every day is a new day as far as the nature is concerned. Why not get it from nature? Because that's your real nature. You're always fresh. Every day is a fresh day. Every day is a new day. Every day you have a newness and freshness and joy. And if you realize this, constant newness even of the body then you go to the mind then you go to the intellect and beyond that you have all that you need for yourself all the powers all the wisdom that you need all the joy that you need is my own self so dive deep within and call out these things this is a great teaching swami vivekananda repeatedly told and when he gave these teachings in the west have been constantly conditioned to believing that they are sinners. From birth, you are, you are a sinner, you are a sinner. Swamiji said, I refuse to call you sinners. You are the children of immortality. Amritasya Putra. 
I will call you the hairs of immortal bliss. Sin is a sin to call a human being so. You are the great immortal self, the Atman, and you are the children of immortality. And all power will come, all depression will cease. I will end with a small story. Since we wake up in this life, there's Emma Calve, who was a great opera singer and an actress, great celebrity in France in those days. That woman was terribly depressed, as most celebrities are. <laughs> So you may be a celebrity from outside, but how much of agony and terrible fear they pass through, very few people know. She became terribly depressed, almost on the verge of ending her life. Somebody told her, you see, you go and meet a great Indian yogi, Swami Vivekananda. He is living in Paris now. She found out and meant to meet Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda is writing something. He, he did not even look up. The moment this lady entered, Vivekananda said, Oh, my child, what a terrible atmosphere you have brought with me today. Calm down, calm down, sit down. The moment she sat down in front of him, he looked at her and started speaking about some of the innermost secrets in her, her life which she had not shared with anybody. She was frightened, confused, flabbergasted. Swami, did anybody speak to you about me? How did you know all this? Swami Vivekananda smiled and said, is it necessary? I can read you like an open book. And they said, calm down. Eliminate all these negative thoughts from your mind. Cheer up again. You are the immortal self, the Vedantic dose which he gave and the spiritual impulse of this great sage went deep into her unconscious mind and the conscious mind had transformed her. She was just about to attain a very high state of spiritual illumination of Samadhi. Losing herself, little self is gone. She started crying, Swami, what are you doing to me? I'm losing myself. <laughs> My individuality is gone. Swami used to make fun of the Westerners. You Westerners are so terribly afraid of losing your individuality. <laughs> Making pun, pun on that word. You are not individuals yet. You shall be when you become universal. Then he told a story. A water drop was falling into the ocean. And the drop started crying. The ocean said, why are they crying, my child? Oh, I'm going to lose my individuality as a drop. The ocean smiled and said, my child, you are not going to lose your individuality as a drop. Regaining your individuality as the ocean. You are with me. You are the ocean. But the sun's rays took you up. And now we're coming back to rejoin the billions and trillions of water drops what drops your brothers and sisters like you come and realize your individuality, the true individuality, which is the ocean. All of us are not individuals separated out. There is no conflict. There is no acrimony. There is no quarrel. And we are one self united in the great entity called Brahman, which is identical with the Atman. Swamiji said, the last words which he spoke on the historic parliament of religions, help upon the banner of every religion will soon be written in spite of resistance, help and not fight, assimilation and not destruction, harmony and peace and not dissensions. The Indians, he said, awake, awake. Let us work hard, my brethren. There is no time for sleep. And our hard work depends on the coming of the India of the future. She is there, ready, waiting. She is only sleeping. Arise and awake and see her seated on the eternal throne, rejuvenated, more glorious than she ever was, this motherland of ours. Jai Sri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai. Jai Swami Vivekananda Ji Ki Jai. Thank you.
thank you sir uh, for your for your enlightening uh, speech now uh, i would like to request uh, the audience if they have any questions to pose their questions Everybody has become fully enlightened. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> if you all have any questions, uh, please uh, use the Q&A chat box and uh, write your questions over there. People want to be quiet. Allow them to be quiet and go ahead. Sir, do you want to ask something? Everybody is meditating. <laughs> so maybe conclude now. Uh, right. Uh, I would like to call upon uh, Garima, my co-anchor, to move forward with the proceedings. Obviously. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, a seasoned academician having teaching and research experience of over 18 years, has served as a guest professor under Magdalene Scotch Fellowship awarded by the University of Hamburg in 2016. He is also the recipient of the prestigious fellowship from the Max Planck University Institute of Comparative Public Law and International Law, Heidelberg, back in 2008. Sir has worked at the Rajiv Gandhi School of IP Law at IIT Kharagpur and thereafter has recently joined HNLU in August 2021 as a registrar. Sir, I now invite you to share your concluding remarks. Thank you, Garima. Uh, good evening to all. My regards to Swami Atma Priyanandji and Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor V.C. Vivekanandan and my other colleagues. Indeed, a very refreshing and uh, very uh, in-depth talk by Swamiji on a very important area. We know that uh, conflict of multiple kinds is uh, prevalent in today's society. And uh, we're really looking forward for a suitable planning a strategy or measures to eliminate the factors which is contributing to disharmony, disorder or war. And as Swamiji has very aptly put the thought of uh, Vivekananji that ethics can play a vital role in building an orderly society, spreading harmony and institutionalizing peace. By delving into his dynamic works and ideas, one could securely construct a conclusion that uh, Vivekananda's contemplation, his way of life, valiance of in his thoughts, teaching teachings, his ideas and understanding on the Indian societies were not only spiritual and religious, but also bears the attributes of a social reformer as well. Swami Vivekananda and his thoughts are not only welcomed by a particular class, caste, creed, religion or reason, but to the entire mankind. His ideology expressions and concerns about societal changes had inspired uh, doing so even today to every segment of society. As Swami Atma Priyananji has shared his thoughts, ethics is a reflection of society's cultural health at a given point of time. And man creates progressive cultural and moral ethos during evolution of human societies. So it is values which exist within all of us, which needs to be realized by every individual. Swamiji, thank you for your insights on the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. I, I believe it is going to be a kind of opening a thought process for our law students. And we are happy to inform you that uh, in this session, it's not only the law students of all law school, but law schools of Raipur City, they have joined this program and they have listened to you. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to call upon 
my co-anchor and the vice convener of the literary debating committee to deliver the vote of thanks. A very good evening to everyone present here again. The second Swami Vivekanand Memorial Lecture on Ethical Values in Contemporary Times, revisiting the teachings of Swami Vivekanand has been successfully conducted and it is only fitting that we express gratitude towards those without whom this wonderful event could not have been possible. On behalf of the HNLU fraternity, it is my honor to express my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guest, Swami Atmapriya Nanji, Prost Chancellor and Secretary Ram Krishna Mission, Vivekanand Educational and Research Institute for gracing the event with his presence and enlightening us on the profound teachings of Swami Vivekanand. I would also like to thank Professor Dr. V.C. Vivekanandan, Honorable Vice Chancellor, for his in invaluable presence tonight. I would also like to thank Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, Registrar, for his constant support and guidance. I would also like to express my sincerest gratitude to the digital team and the administration for efficiently handling the event throughout. At the end, I would like to thank the audience for being patient and kindly listening to the program. Thank you everyone for their cooperation. Thank you, Swamiji.